So this evening we're going to be continuing our study uh, out of the gospel according to Mark. And as you know, we're in a, a series of uh, lessons uh, dealing with the healings and the miracles uh, that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ performed uh, as re- during his earthly ministry, three-year earthly ministry, uh, as is recorded for us in the gospel according to Mark. Uh, tonight we're going to deal with uh, two different uh, instances of miracles and healings that our Lord performed. Uh, one is going to be Peter's mother-in-law is healed, and the second is going to be Jesus heals many people uh, on the Sabbath day. And a text is taken from the Gospel according to Mark chapter number 1. And tonight we're going to deal with verses uh, 29 through 39. So if you have your Bibles, uh, you can turn to Mark chapter 1. And again, we're going to deal with this evening, verses 29 through 39. And I'll read these verses in your hearing. The Bible says, Now as soon as they had come out of the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. But Simon's wife's mother lay sick with a fever. And they told him, being Jesus, about her at once. So he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. And immediately the fever left her, and she began to minister or to serve them. At evening time, when the sun had set, they brought to him, again, this is Jesus, all who were sick and those who were demon-possessed. And the whole city was gathered at the door. Then he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed into a solitary place. And there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. When they found him, they said to him, everyone is looking for you. But he said to them, let us go into the next towns that I may preach there also. Because for this purpose, I have come forth. And he was preaching in their synagogues throughout all of Galilee and casting out demons. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity that you have given us, Father God, to study your precious word. God, we thank you for every soul that sacrificed their time, Father God, this evening to come out and hear the word of God. And we ask that you would bless them, Father God, in a special way. God, we pray for both the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. that He may provide both teaching and learning and application power that we may be able, Father God, to clearly understand the text that's before us today and that we may go beyond understanding it, but that we may, Father God, apply it to our everyday lives. What an example that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ left us. We are excited about learning, Father God, from him tonight. Open up our understanding. Prepare both hearts and minds, Father, for the seed of the word of God. And we'll be careful to give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. For all praise, glory, and honor is due you. For you are God that is worthy to be praised. God, we ask all these things. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Now, the setting for this evening's text is very, very clear. If you take a look at verse number 29, it says, Now, as soon as they had come out of the synagogue. Now, the text that's before us today comes on the heels of the text that we dealt with last time we were together. If you remember, Jesus Christ went into a synagogue in the fishing village of Capernaum. And in the text, we learned that Jesus Christ preached the truth of the word of God with authority. Now, this word authority not only deals with 
Jesus Christ's oratorical ability, his oratory, his speech. But it also talked about the command he had of the truth of the word of God. Anybody that uh, is an expert in any given discipline, we call that person in a, a authority. So you have an authority in the law, you have authority in science, uh, you even have authorities in, the, in theology. So when they said that he preached with authority, they only talked about his oratory, but they also were talking about he was an expert in the truth of the word of God. Not only was he an expert in the truth of the word of God, Jesus Christ is the truth of the word of God. He is the truth of God. We know this because in the first chapter of the gospel according to John, John says that, and the word became flesh, this is verse 16, and dwelt among us, tabernacled among us. This is talking, he's talking here about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And it says, and the glory of the only begotten of the Father, speaking of Christ, he was full of both grace and truth. So when we say that Jesus Christ is an authority in the truth of the word of God, he is the truth of the word of God. Staying in the gospel according to John, remember the dialogue that Jesus Christ had with his disciples and Thomas in particular. And he tells Thomas, I am the way, the truth and the life. So Jesus was in the uh, synagogue in Capernaum and, and he preached and taught the word of God with authority. But also Jesus, while he was in that synagogue, demonstrated his power, his dominion and his authority over the demonic realm. Because Jesus Christ delivered a man that was in the synagogue, in church, that was demon possessed. Now remember, only God has the power over the demonic realm. So when Jesus told that demon to come out of the man, and the demon had no choice but to obey, it demonstrates that Jesus is exactly who he said he is, and that is God in the flesh. We made the point last time we were together that the demons were afraid and they were terrified of Jesus. But we also made the point that demons are not afraid nor are they terrified of us. And if you remember, uh, uh, we made the point that the Bible never tells us to go around looking for folk that are demon-possessed and try to have some type of exorcism. And in fact, uh, we went to uh, the Acts of the Apostles and we uh, heard about or read about the story of the seven sons of Sceva. It's a funny story, uh, but it's also a very serious story also. If you remember, these men went around uh, looking to cast... Uh, uh, demons out of people uh, using the name of Jesus Christ and the name of Paul. And they were doing this not for uh, to deliver people, but they were doing it for sordid gain. You remember they came up upon one man that was filled uh, with a demon. And they said that we adjure you in the name of Paul in the name of Christ to come out of this man. And the demon spoke through the man and said, look, we know Paul. And we certainly know Christ, but we don't know who you are. And the text tells us that that demon in that man jumped on seven grown men. And the Bible says that he beat them all up and stripped them down naked and sent them out in disgrace out in the streets. Now that is a lesson for us today. We ought not to be going around looking to uh, cast out demons. We are to resist the devil. The Bible says that he's going to flee from us. But we resist the devil in a very practical way. That is by being full of the truth of the word of God. Because the Bible tells us, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Amen. Now it is on the heels of this experience that Christ had in the synagogue that we find ourselves now in verse number 29 of the text. Now, there, as soon as they were coming out of the synagogue, they entered into the house of Simon, this is Simon Peter, and his brother Andrew, and, and, and was with them was James and his brother John, along, of course, with Jesus. Now, in verse number 30, when they enter into 
Simon Peter and Andrew's house. So we know uh, from the gospel according to John that Simon and Andrew were from the city of Bethsaida. You remember uh, when we dealt with uh, the text last time we were together, we learned that Capernaum was a fishing village. So Simon, Peter, and Andrew and their family moved to Capernaum for financial reasons because they were fishermen by trade. And they come into the house of Simon, Peter, and Andrew, and verse 30 tells us that Simon's wife lay sick with a fever. So they come into his house, and they begin to tell Jesus, the Bible says, and they told him, being Jesus, at once about her condition. Now we know from the New Testament writings that Peter had a wife. We also know that his wife was very instrumental in his ministry. When Peter went to his various missionary journeys, the Bible indicates that Peter's wife went along with him. And she was instrumental in that ministry so much so when Peter was crucified as a martyr, they crucified Peter's wife right along with him. And historians tell us that while they were being crucified for the cause of Christ, Peter was ministering and encouraging his wife uh, during that ordeal. So we know that Peter was married and the Bible tells us that Peter's mother-in-law lay sick with a fever and when Christ came into the house they told him about her at once now we take a look at Luke's parallel gospel and we know that Luke was a physician he was a doctor Luke characterizes uh, Peter's mother-in-law's fever as a high fever and this was a very serious condition because the Bible indicates that she was bedridden by this fever now, we have to take a look at, at, at back in the first century. Now, in the 21st century, we know that a fever is a symptom of an underlying infection. There's an, that Peter's mother-in-law has some type of inf infection. As a consequence of that infection, she has a fever. Now, today, if you and I have uh, some form of, of ailment, uh, we go to our primary care doctor. Uh, that doctor uses state-of-the-art instruments uh, and technology to accurately diagnose our problem. Then he writes us up a couple of prescriptions. We go to a local Walgreens, Rite Aid, CVS. We fill that prescription. We take the prescription best, and in a couple of days, God heals us through that process. Amen? But in the first century, there was no primary care doctor. In the first century, there was no state-of-the-art technology, and there was no prescription drugs. So this underlying infection that caused Peter's mother-in-law to have a high fever, which resulted in her being bedridden, was a serious condition. The fact that she was bedridden, we can induce to that that it probably was a life-threatening condition. This is a very, very serious condition. Luke tells us uh, that when Jesus Christ came into Peter's house, they made requests concerning his mother-in-law. And again, logically they were saying, here's her condition, can you heal her? And the Bible says in verse 31 of our text that Jesus came and took her by the hand and lifted her up and immediately the Bible says the fever left her. Again, going to Luke's gospel, Luke tells us that Jesus Christ stood over her and rebuked the fever. Then took her by the hand, lifted her up, and the Bible says that immediately the fever left her. Notice the nature of when God, through Jesus Christ, heals you. It is an immediate, comprehensive healing. Now we just talked about how things go when we go to the doctor in the 21st century. If you and I have the flu, the doctor may be able to diagnose that flu accurately. He's going to give us some antibiotics and probably some Tamiflu. But it's going to take some time, right, for that medicine, those powerful drugs, to get into our system and to do its work. But here, the Bible declares 
that Jesus, when he healed her, the fever left her instantaneously. Now, when Jesus healed you, there's no take two of these and call me in the morning. It was a complete and comprehensive and instantaneous healing. Look at the nature of the healing now. This woman is bedridden with a fever. Jesus Christ immediately heals her, and the Bible says she gets up and begins to minister or to serve them. Now, this is no small feat. Remember, we're at Peter's house. Peter has a wife, and he got children. Si uh, uh, Andrew, he has a wife and he has children. We also have James and John are there. And of course, our Lord is there. So when we say that she is ministering unto them, what it means is that she is preparing literally a small feast. And we know that our Jewish brothers and sisters, they know how to eat. So this was not a, a, a little uh, a one course meal. This was a small feast that Peter's mother was preparing and just a few minutes ago, she was bedridden, probably sick unto death. This is the power that Jesus Christ has. Now, my Bible tells me that only God is a healer. Healing power comes from God. The psalmist says, you are the God that does what? That healeth me. So again, Christ demonstrates exactly who he said he is, and that is God in the flesh not only has he demonstrated his power over, over the demonic world, he now has demonstrated his power over sickness and disease. Let's hasten to verse number 32. Listen very carefully now. You, you, you can't miss this. At evening, say evening. evening. When the sun had set, they brought to Jesus all who were sick, and those who were demon-possessed. Verse 33, and the whole city, we're talking about now the city of Capernaum, the entire city was gathered at the door. This is at the door of Peter's house. Let's begin to break down these verses. First of all, we want to draw our attention to at evening time. Remember that this is on the Sabbath day. Now we know that God had established that the Sabbath day was a day of rest. God created the whole of the earth in six days, and the seventh day, the Bible said he rested from all his labor. So the Sabbath day was a day of rest. Now at the time that this event took place, many of the rabbis and the Pharisees and the scribes had added on crazy restrictions on the Sabbath day. Needless to say, it was illegal, according to Mosaic law at that time, to carry anything, listen now, or anyone during the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day ended when the sun set it at evening time. Are you listening? So the Bible says at evening time, when the sun had set, they brought to him all that were sick and those who were demon-possessed. So this tells us that the minute that the Mosaic law afforded them, they brought their sick and their disease and their demon possessed to Jesus Christ. The minute they had the opportunity to do so. Verse 33 tells us the entire city of Capernaum was gathered at the door of Peter's house. We're talking about thousands of people. So we know here that Word has gotten around. Mm -hmm. Again, all this is taking place in one day. The word has gotten around that this man, Jesus, is preaching with authority. The word has gotten around uh, that he has power over the demonic realm. We know this because in Mark chapter 1, verse 27, the Bible says, Then they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, what in the world is going on? What is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority, he commands even unclean spirits and they obey him. The Bible says, and immediately the popularity or the fame of Jesus did what spread throughout all the region round about Galilee. So the word had gotten out. 
Also, the word had gotten out that Jesus Christ had healed Peter's mother-in-law, who was bedridden with a high fever. Because now she is up and about preparing a small feast. The neighbors are looking. They're saying, well, she was just bedridden uh, just earlier this, uh, this morning. And they're saying, well, Jesus, this same Jesus that preached in the synagogue, cast out demons, this same Jesus healed my mother-in-law. So the word is out now. The word is out. And they're bringing everybody that they can to Jesus that he may heal them. Listen to 34. Listen to the compassion and the love and the grace and the mercy of the God that we serve. He says, the Bible says, then he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. Let's stop right there. The word many, all right? Let's make sure we get this uh, in the proper context. Doesn't mean that he selected many out of the crowd. He healed everybody that came to him, and Mark just characterized that as many people. He didn't say, well, I'm going to heal Rhonda, I'm going to heal Jalen, I'm going to heal David, but Jaquetta and Javon, you guys are out. No, he healed everybody, and the everybody Mark characterized as many. And they came with all kinds of diseases. And you had folk that were, kept, that were filled and possessed by demons. Let's talk about this healing for a second. We already have said that when Christ heals you, it is instantaneous, it is comprehensive, and it's complete. Let's talk about another component of the way Christ heals. First of all, when he heals in this context, there are no conditions. Oftentimes, these so-called faith healers put on conditions by which if you meet these conditions, then you're going to get your healing, you're going to get your breakthrough, you're going to get your deliverance. Oftentimes, uh, these prerequisites are intangible. In other words, you can't put your hands on them. You can't see them. You have to have a measure of faith. The text did not tell us that Jesus Christ healed folk with faith. He didn't say, it didn't say that he healed folk with money. The Bible says that he healed everybody. Those that had no faith, those that had little faith, those that had much faith. Same thing with cash in their pocket. Those that have no money, little money, and much money. He healed everybody. There was no prerequisite. But oftentimes you hear these faith healers, they say, well, uh, Jaquetta, we're going to heal you of your ailment. You can't see all that well. You can might as well throw away those glasses that you have on your face. And when we go over there and then we lay hands on Jaquetta, and Jaquetta's sight doesn't change. It stays the same. And then what they say to Jaquetta is, the reason why you did not get your healing and your deliverance is because you didn't have enough faith. Well, faith is intangible. You can't see it. Now, you can see the evidence of faith, for the Bible says faith without works is what? It's dead. Faith is like the wind. You can't see the wind, but you can see the, wind, the effects of the wind. So how much faith does Jaquetta need? Does she need a foot of faith? Maybe she needs a yard of faith or a mile of faith. Or maybe the faith is measured in weight. You need a pound of faith? Two pounds? Five pounds? This is all a ruse that people use, false teachers, false preachers use for filthy lucre or for sordid gain. Another one is, uh, if you sow this amount of seed, you're going to get your breakthrough, you're going to get your healing. You're going to get your deliverance. But all too often when that breakthrough, when that healing, when that deliverance does not come, then they're quick to tell you, well, David, you didn't sow enough seed. And when you sowed the seed, you didn't have the proper measure of faith. This is a way of denying their culpability of not delivering on a thing that they claim they can promise you. Why are these faith healers going down to Centera? Why are they going to the 
ICU and CCU wars and healing everybody. Because they themselves know that they are frauds. Jesus Christ is the real deal. These are verifiable healings. No one here is denying that they were healed. And he placed no conditions on them. The B clause of verse number 34, it says, And he did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. Remember the last time we were here, Jesus Christ told the demon to hold your peace. Right? Because he didn't want the demons testifying on his behalf. You know, th th there are some people that uh, they may have some positive things to say about you, but you can say, well, you know what? I really don't want you speaking on my behalf. This is what Christ is talking about. Jesus, through, during his earthly ministry, was always dogged by the idea, particularly from the religious leaders, that the power that you use comes from the power of Satan. And he didn't want them speaking on his behalf. To that end, let's go to, we're in Mark, let's go to Mark chapter number 3. I want you to see this here. One of the reasons why Christ said, told them to hold their peace. Mark chapter number 3. And let's begin reading in verse number 22. Mark chapter 3, 20, verse 22. Look what it says. And the scribes, say scribes, who came down from Jerusalem. Now these were big wigs. Now Jerusalem is the capital city. That's like President Obama sending folks down from Washington. Now these weren't the one of the mill scribes. These were the creme de la creme, if you will, of the, 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 the scribes uh, of that day. They came down from Jerusalem. And they said about Jesus, he has Beelzebub. The word Beelzebub means the Lord of the flies. And it is a slur that was attributed to Satan. And it's by the ruler of the demons, again, another slur attributed to Satan, that he cast out demons. So what they're saying is, yeah, you're casting out demons, but you're casting out demons by the power of Satan. Now listen to what Christ's response to you is. Listen how he responds and listen to the way he responds. First of all, how he responds. Look what he says to them. He says, the Bible says, so he called them to himself. He said, you over here that are saying these things that I have the power, that I do the things that I do by the power of Satan. You over here, come over here to me. He did it with power and authority because a lot of times, you know, people talk about Jesus. They say, well, he's weak and feeble. And we as Christians ought to be also weak and feeble. But as a God of your own making, that is not the God of the Bible. Jesus Christ directly told them, you that are making this blasphemous claim. We're going to see that in a minute. You come to me. Now, Jesus Christ always spoke with authority and he always spoke with love. Here's the love. He begins to try to reason with them as an act of evangelism because God and his nature is a savior. Look what he says to them. He's reasoning with them in their minds. He says to them, how can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. What is he saying to them? Those demons don't want to come out of those people. They're happy to stay right in those people and to control them. So when Christ is casting the demons out, he is defeating the purpose of those demons. Why would Satan defeat his own purposes? This is what Christ is saying to them. It makes no sense. And, and, and if a house is divided against itself, is it going to stand? And if, at verse 26, and if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand but has what? Has an end. If Satan keeps using power to cast out his own demons, 
He's what defeating himself, and he ain't going to do that. He's a defeated foe, but he's not doing anything to hasten that defeat. Verse 27, look at this is love now, but this is not weak and feeble. He's talking direct to them. And he says to them, no man uh, can, uh, no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds a strong man. And then he will plunder his house. Now, in order to get to my family, you got to take me down. And I'm going I'm I'm to use every thing at my disposal to protect my family. This is what Christ is talking about here. And look what it says here in verse number 28. Here's the crux of it right here. Verily, verily, or surely I say unto you, all sins will be forgiven, the sons of men. But whatever blasphemies they may utter, but he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has what? Forgiveness. But is subject to what? Eternal condemnation. When they said, You're the power that Christ used to cast out demons was the power of Satan, they committed the sin of blasphemy, which simply is unbelief. That's the sin of blasphemy. It's unbelief. They have total revelation. In other words, they look at, at Jesus like you guys are looking at me. They heard with their own ears his preaching. They seen with, his own, with their own eyes his miracles. But yet after seeing that and hearing that, their assessment is you're of the devil. So if you have total revelation, what more can you have? This is why Christ says you're subject to what? Eternal condemnation. Now, you and I, in this dispensation, we don't have total revelation. John says at the end of his gospel, if we were to record all the things that Christ did, he said there are not enough books in the world that could contain it. But you know what? We got enough. We got enough to believe, and we have enough to live out our lives in a God-honoring manner. So he tells them, be quiet. For this express purpose. Let's jump back to Mark chapter number three. So he heals everybody. Amen. Showing his grace, his mercy, his love, and his power. Now look what it says here in verse number 35. Now in the morning, this is a long day. He began the day preaching in the synagogue. Went to Peter's house for some lunch and ends up healing thousands of folk. In the morning, though, the Bible says, having risen a long while before daylight, Jesus went out and departed into a solitary place. And there, what did he do? He prayed. Now, here we have the Lord of glory. We have a man the Bible declares went about doing good. Was tempted in every point possible but without sin. If he felt the need to go to a solitary place how much more should you and I, who at best are sinners saved by God's grace, be committed to going to a solitary place and there commune with God in prayer? Every now and then, now when I say every now and then, I'm talking about every day. We ought to be in a solitary place where we can commune with God in prayer. Because the Bible tells us that as Christians, we are to be in an attitude of prayer. We're to pray, the Bible says, without ceasing. Because it's hard to curse somebody out when you are in an attitude of prayer. It's hard to hate folk when you are in an attitude of prayer. It's hard to commit fornication when you and I are in an attitude of prayer. 
It's hard not to offer up biblical forgiveness. Lord have mercy. When we are in an attitude of prayer. Let me get my children. It's hard to disobey mom and dad when you are in an attitude of prayer. This is why God says pray without ceasing. Because it's easier for us to stay in line with the purposes of God when we are in an attitude of prayer. If Christ thought it necessary, how much more should you and I be committed to prayer? Look what it says here in verse number 36. And Simon and those who were with him, they, they, they were looking for Jesus. Because he, he either got up early in the morning. We're talking about, the Bible said, a great while before daylight. And, and they're, they're looking for him. And, and verse 37, when they find him, they said to him, everybody is looking for you. Now, the disciples, they were patriots. They were concerned and wanted to be out of the tyranny of the Roman rule. They wanted freedom for their people. They were patriots. And what they wanted to do is they wanted to capitalize on the fame and the popularity that Jesus had engendered by his acts of power and by his preaching. This was something that was dear to their heart. And you know what? This was something that they talked about at the time that Jesus Christ had ascended back to heaven. That they had seen Jesus on the earth for three years. They had seen him crucified, buried, rose again the third day. And they asked him in Acts chapter 1, are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel now? And Jesus Christ says to them, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons. But I'm going to tell you this, you're going to receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And that power is going to uh, empower you or give you the capability to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the other most parts of the world. Everyone is looking for you. Let's capitalize on your fame and your popularity. Notice what Jesus Christ said to him. He said to them, let us go into the next towns. <laughs> let us go into the next towns that I may preach, say preach, there also, say what? Because for this purpose, I have come forth. Now most of us would say, let me go and go back to that crowd and, and get my just desserts. Because at times that's our motive. To be seen of men, to get the proverbial pat on the back. But Jesus Christ said, no, I'm going to the next towns. And there he said, I'm going to do what I'm going to preach. Now what is he preaching? I'm glad you asked. Let's stay in Mark chapter number one. Let's go up to verse number 14. The disciples are looking for him. When they find him, say, everybody looking for you, man. Let's go back. Let's capitalize on this fame and fortune, on this popularity. He says, no, we're going to go to the next towns because I want to preach there because this is the reason that I came. What's he preaching? Verse 14 says, Now after John, of Mark chapter 1, after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Gospel is good news of the kingdom of God. What's the kingdom of God? In this uh, dispensation period of time the kingdom of God is in our hearts the kingdom of God talks about God's sovereign rule over our lives 
You see, everybody wants Jesus as Savior because nobody in their right mind wants to go to hell. But very few people want to receive Jesus Christ as Lord of their lives. Because when Jesus Christ is Lord of your life, that means that I have to yield my will and my desires to him. He, I do what he tells me to do, when he tells me to do it, how he tells me to do it, because he is sovereign in my life. This notion that you can believe a few facts about Jesus Christ and you can say a prescriptive prayer and you're going to be saved and your life is not going to change, that's bad theology. Because my Bible tells me when we receive Christ, all things have done what? They passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That is regeneration. That is the new birth. That's why we say we are born again. Jesus Christ tells, I believe it was Nicodemus, who asked him, how do you inherit eternal life? He said, you got to be born again. There should be a metamorphosis in your life. A change. So he's preaching the kingdom of God, which is God's sovereign rule now in our hearts. It's going to be a literal kingdom one day in the millennial reign. And he tells them to do what? First of all, the kingdom of God is at hand. In order to have a kingdom, you got to have a king. Jesus at this time was on the earth. He's at hand. It's around the corner, not in our hours and, and, and time frame. But in the time frame of God, what else is he preaching? Repent and believe in the gospel. Believe is salvation. Repentance is sanctification. Repentance is a change in your mind, in your heart, in your conduct. In the New Testament, salvation and repentance are synonymous because they're hand in hand. This idea that I'm going to say a prayer and I'm going to live like the devil for the rest of my life and die and go to heaven is bad theology. The Bible indicates that when we receive Christ as Lord and Savior, when God gives us that saving faith, there's going to be a change in our lives. You're not going to be perfect. You never will be in this lifetime. But let me tell you something. You ain't got no business dealing with the same issues You've been saved for 20 years and you still deal with the same issues. You were cussing folk out uh, when you got saved 20 years ago and you're still cussing folk out. My daughter is six years old. Now, she was born in 1990, right? And looking like that, you would say, well, there's something wrong with that child. <laughs> yeah, and there is something wrong with a child looking like that and, and, and born in 1990. It's the same thing of a Christian. There's something wrong when you've been saved for 20 years and you're still dealing with the same issues. We're here. He was preaching salvation. And the evidence, if you will, of salvation, which is what? Repentance. Being godfully sorry for our sin produces repentance in our life. Amen? Amen. What a glorious Savior that we serve. His compassion for Peter's mother-in-law, for those multitude of people that he healed. And we see his focus, which should be our focus. And that is to preach the truth of the word of God. You don't have to have no license to do that. You and I preach the kingdom of God is at hand and repent and believe by our lifestyle and by our good theology that we got to study to be able to articulate to God's people. Next time we meet, we're going to see the compassion of Jesus Christ as he heals a man that has the dreaded disease of leprosy. We're going to see how leprosy was not only a disease, but it was a disease that made you an outcast in society. But that's going to be next time. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much. God, we are humbled 
we are in awe of the compassion and the love and the power of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. God, you are a good God. You're, you're worthy of all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. There's none like you. And it is, Father God, a privilege to serve you. God, our hearts are pricked as we think about the things that we have done to miss the mark of your standard. God, we're sorry. And God, we ask for forgiveness individually and collectively. Help us, Father God, to be like our Lord, loving, compassionate, strong, direct. And help us to have his focus. That is to preach and to teach and to live the idea of salvation and repentance. That we may be, Father God, who we say we are, that is believers. Because, Father God, Jesus is coming back soon. And we're glad about it. Bless us, Father God, but also make us a blessing. We ask all these things in the powerful name of Jesus Christ we pray. And all of God's children say, Amen.